ready to go. And I want to look at the Passover and attendance because I found something in the instructions about the Passover that I thought was interesting um, as we think about attendance in the um, in the New Testament and think about our coming together as the church. It is uh, a blessing for us to come together. We are intended to come together for the better and not for the worse, to build each other up and to strengthen each other in the, in the word, encourage each other on, and I hope that that's the case. Um, but I found this thing in the Passover that I thought was interesting and, and worth examination. Although I think that it's a fairly brief thought. But there's an account in Numbers chapter 9, a little bit later in the history of the people, not the first Passover at the time that they left Egypt, but subsequently when it is to be observed. And God is playing with Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they'd come out of the land of Egypt, saying, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time according to all its statutes and all its rules, you shall keep it. So this is a clear reference back to the instructions of Exodus 12, 2, <clears throat> which had said, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It is the first month of the year for you. So in, when they were in the second year, in the first month of the year, he tells them, let them keep the Passover at its appointed time, 14th of this month. So it's interesting, you know, he set the calendar, he told them when to meet. He said that this is a, an appointed time. It's, a, you know, it's, it's already decided. It's legislated, if you will, in the law of Moses, that is, the, the Passover is. And the time is fairly clear, as he said there. On the third verse, the 14th day of the month at twilight, which is also what Exodus 12 had to say about it. So it's just reminding them that this is how you do it. And that's an appointed time. It was precisely appointed. In verse 6, you find this happening. There were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And these men said to him, uh, uh, yeah, these men said to him, we're unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people? And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear what the Lord will command me. And the Lord did command him. But it's interesting. There were certain men who had become unclean through touching a dead body. What we mean by this is somebody died and they were pallbearers or they were preparing the body for a burial. Some relative of theirs is lost. It's not something that you can put off or not do. You have to do this. But it meant because they had touched a dead body, they were ritually unclean according to the law, and so they couldn't partake of a sacrifice like this. And they came before Moses and Aaron and said, hey, we have this problem. We, we had to take care of the dead. We also have to honor the law about being ritually unclean, but we also have an appointed time for the Passover that we cannot do. And Moses said, I'll ask about it. And he did. And the Lord told him in the 10th verse, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body, or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall keep it. So the first month is the prescribed time, the appointed time, in Exodus 12, and what he told them to do. But when this first month came, the fourteenth day, these people were unclean. Now the Lord says, oh, they're still going to keep it. They're just going to do it in the second month on the 14th day at twilight. That's interesting to me. As he said, because they were unclean through touching a dead body, as in there was this obligation and yet it renders them unclean. Or is on a long journey. And, and certainly in those days, there was no guaranteeing what date you would be back, even if you were trying to get back before January 1st, you know. If you were traveling by boat or whatever, it could be very, very long. Um, so there's no telling, right? And he said that. 
If they're unclean, if they're on the long journey, well, they'll still keep it. They'll do it in the second month, on the 14th day. So there's some wiggle room there. And that's the, the point, I think, that we want to make, is that they had an appointed time that they were to make. That was supposed to be important, and it was. And it was important to these men because they came forward to ask, what do we do? We have a problem. We can't observe it. And the Lord said, well, you can still observe it. You'll do it on the second month. It's going to happen. There will be another opportunity to do this because you were unclean or for those perhaps who were on a long journey and delayed beyond the appointed time. However, the 13th verse follows it up by saying, But if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. So on the 13th, what you're reading is, yeah, now, on the other hand, if you're present and you are clean and you don't keep the Passover, well, that's rebellion. That's an open rebellion. That person is cut off. And the reason that it's called sin is he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. It's the Lord who's being worshipped and the Lord who's being served. Now, don't, I, you know, I thought that there was a great risk, and there is, of being misunderstood here. And so I want to clarify this. I'm not saying, nor have I ever said, um, nor would I ever support anybody who said that we should be advocating the death penalty for people who miss services. <laughs> okay? I'm not saying that. Um, and there are people who say things like, well, you know, Jesus went to the cross. Uh, you know, if it wouldn't keep him from going to the cross, it shouldn't keep me from going to services, you know. That is a silly argument that's preposterous. There are things that happen that keep you from going. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that there is an application of this principle to priorities, to what is important to me. What do I plan on? What do I foresee? And if, for some reason, the appointed time I'm not available, am I trying to make the next opportunity. You know, that's about priority, is what we're saying. I would not make direct application to attendance, because here you're talking about something that happens once a year, is a, you know, is a national holiday with a specific date and time, and the penalty for not engaging in it is death. That's not like the services of the church at all. <laughs> so that's not what we're saying. Please don't misunderstand me on this. That's not what we're getting at. What we're saying is the priorities are there. That These men who came forward were men who wanted to take the Passover, but were excluded from doing so because they had touched a dead body. But you have to touch a dead body to bury your loved one. So what do we do? You know, that's their position. That's very different from the person who is not on a journey, the person who's present and is clean, who could do it, but they just don't. That's about priorities. That's what we're saying. And for those whose priority was serving the Lord, the Lord made them this exception so that they could be able to, to come together at another time, and it would still be acceptable to God. And I thought about the fact that we in the church are celebrating the Passover, spiritually speaking. Again, not to impose the legal restrictions there, or penalties, but to say that we also are partaking of the Passover whenever we come together on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. 
It is what was written in 1 Corinthians 11 at verse 26. As often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. When we come together, whenever we do this, however often we do it, it is the Lord that we are proclaiming. And it is his return that we are proclaiming, not just a dead Lord, but a risen Lord. And that's an appointed time in a sense, not in a literal appointed time, as in the Bible provides you a time at which you must meet. But it's the appropriate way to worship God, the appropriate priority. And that's something that we do come together to do. And something that we know is coming, that we can plan for, that we can think about. And there might be reasons why we can't come together that are valid reasons, the same as being ritually unclean under the law of Moses or being on that long journey. But just like Leviticus 9 had said, however, if that isn't the case, that there is not some good reason for this, then it actually is a sin, the same way Hebrews 10 says basically the same thing, and it is about priority. Where it is written in the 25th verse down to the 31st, that we ought not to be neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but rather encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully or deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there can no longer remain a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who sets aside the law of Moses dies on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who's trampled underfoot the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, outraged the Spirit of grace? We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the record. But I want to point out again that it's about priorities. When he says not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, what we're saying is the principle of Passover, that it is important to me is what ought to be the case. I'm planning to be there. I want to be there. If I'm not there, something is wrong. I'm sick or I'm traveling or something has happened. The opposite of that would be deliberate sin, for which there can be no sacrifice. The opposite of that is where, well, it's just not important to me. It's optional. I'll go if I feel like it. That's not putting God first in life. And that's not going to please him. But when you look at what he says there, if you go on sinning willfully... In the 29th verse... You've trampled the Son of God underfoot, profaned the blood of the covenant, outraged the spirit of grace. These are the themes from the Passover, too. That God has saved us, that God, that God gave his only Son. He shed his blood to, to, to bring us forgiveness, that he, because of his grace, saved a people out of the slavery of Egypt, and he, because of his grace, saved us out of our slavery to sin. But as we say, God will judge his people. So what I'm getting at is intended to be the positive side of this, which follows here in the 35th verse of Hebrews 10. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So here's what, what we're saying is the reason, you know, why do you meet two times on a Sunday? Well, we meet two times on a Sunday because 
we love one another because we assume that people have good reasons why they cannot be there for one time or another. That's the basic assumption. Maybe somebody was traveling. Maybe somebody had car trouble. Oh, uh, well, why were they not here, you know, for the earlier, but they're here for the later? Well, maybe they felt sick and thought perhaps that they had some communicable problem, but then came to realize that, no, it wasn't that, and that it was safe for them to come out and to go forward in the, in the worship. And so they made the second assembling together, if you will, the second time that's appointed. Or whatever the case is, you know, love demands that we assume the best about one another. And that's what we're doing. If we're leaving the Lord's Supper prepared, you know, for somebody who hasn't had their turn yet, thinking they will come when they can be here, and if they do come and we do serve it, this is based in the assumption that they were not here for good reason. Not because it's not important for them or it's just not convenient for them, but because they genuinely cannot do that. And we treat one another with love and the benefit of the doubt and kindness and deference. That's why we do this thing a couple of times. Uh, that's why we are willing to wait on one another. And I see that between the lines there in that Passover thing. Those fellows came to Moses saying, we really want to do this, and yet we know that it's against the law. And God saw that too and made a provision for them. You come back in the second month. So he came up with the idea that maybe you have more than one time that you, that you do this thing. for people who genuinely couldn't do it. Even though he calls out, you know, bad motives or bad priorities where somebody could do it, but they just don't. They just choose to do something else. Something else is more important to them. Well, that's not acceptable to God, and it never is going to be acceptable to God. But that's not the focus. The focus is we have something that you can do. And we do this in love. We do this in respect for God, and we do it in respect for our fellow servant of God and love for one another. And I think that that's part of our confidence, and that's part of our endurance. We're sticking it out, and we're sticking it through. We're going to keep going and help one another on. All right. Regardless of the case there, whatever the reasons, you know, we do assume the best. And we ought to assume the best of one another. And God made a way. And he'll make a way for us too. If today you are not a Christian, you need to become a Christian to have the forgiveness of God. And God will make a way, though it might seem difficult or impossible. <laughs> In life, there's a sense in which it is. Without God's help, it's impossible. You won't be able to live the Christian life. You won't be able to save yourself. That's true. But with God's help, all things are possible. He will help each one of us who desire him earnestly from the heart, who repent of sins, who confess Jesus with the mouth as the Son of God, who are buried in baptism, in water, together with him for forgiveness of sins who are raised up to walk in newness of life. We have water prepared that you might be baptized. But as a Christian, have you been living right? Let us pray with you for you. Think about the opportunities that God has afforded us to come together. And of course, we want to avail ourselves of all those things, but we need also to be thankful for the multiple opportunities that he allows us so that we might be reconciled to him. Our God is very patient and very kind. And we should be like him. If today you need the prayers of the saints, so you need to be baptized. Let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>